complain the weather yesterday was awesome. Um, anyway, a little weather comment. Is that all you got, Dorf? All right. <clears throat> well, good morning. We're going to dive into God's Word. If, uh, if you're new with us this morning, we are uh, traveling over the next handful of weeks in Isaiah, chapters 40 through 55. So if you do uh, have a Bible, uh, just grab one in front of you or grab yours and open up to uh, Isaiah 41. We're going to start there. Uh, but just a little recap <clears throat> in this section. This, this section is known as the Songs of the Servant. And uh, arguably, it's one of the greatest poems ever written. At the time, in, uh, at the time uh, Israel is in exile. Uh, they're in exile to Babylon. Uh, they were exiled in 585 B.C., and uh, they're, they're kind of reading this. About a generation later, when Isaiah had written it in about 700 B.C., and uh, so that's where we're at. And here's the overarching question uh, that we have for kind of this section, is how will God's people be guided and led by Yahweh when they're sitting in exile? Now, the height of the Israel kingdom was about 1,000 B.C., and from there on, they began to uh, kind of go against the will of Yahweh. They started intermarrying with different nations and cultures and taking on those idols and the gods of their, those foreign nations, and their hearts began to get divided. And as the, the long journey uh, uh, to get to the place of exile, God would send prophets with the strong message, turn and repent, come back to Yahweh. But the appeal of the gods, the appeal of the idols uh, was drawing God's people's heart away. And so now they're in exile. Now God's judgment has come upon the nation of Israel. And in order to kind of get their heart back, he sends them to exile. And this is the message for them. Things have gone off the rails, continually giving themselves over. And what you'll see is that Israel has been for sure compromised. And the whole picture of this section is this. God saying to the nation of Israel, actually, it's okay, I'm in charge, and we're going to sort this situation out. I know all about your failure, now I'm going to do something. God is not giving up on his creation, he's not giving up on his covenant, and he's going to reorient his people around this servant that he speaks of in this section. Now, uh, at certain times, the word servant can mean the nation of Israel, and he's my people, my servant, come back to me. But in this section, he refers to also a coming servant that's going to make all things right and make a new covenant with man. And we can read even in uh, Ezekiel where the same word would, would take a sto your stony, stubborn heart out and give you a heart of flesh. Take your pride out and give you a life in the Spirit. Yahweh himself is going to come to rescue the people are powerless in their brokenness, and it'll be God who will do what, he ha what has to be done, because he comes as judge and savior to win his people back to himself. So you ready to dive into this next section? All right, so we may hear this, this kind of story, this kind of history of Israel, but as we're kind of going through the story, just kind of think, man, this could be a word God's going to speak to me, maybe even about you and us in this generation. Amen? Same God, yesterday, today, and forever. All right, so let's pray. Lord God, thank you for your word, and thank you that we get to come and sit before you and your word and marinate in your presence. God, speak to us. Father, I pray that no matter where we're at, God, you'd bring us, lead us, and uh, finish our faith. Lord, uh, move us forward in you. Help us grow. Amen. Amen. So uh, this morning, we're going to cover a little bit of larger section. Last week, we just covered one chapter. Today, uh, we're going we're gonna to smash six together. How about that, huh? Uh, we're going to go through one through four, or 41 through 47. Uh, but as we turn to chapter 41, it seems as God has summoned a contest between Yahweh and the gods. Now, let's have it out. And there's this back and forth between the might and strength and the provision of Yahweh and the foolishness of giving your life over to idols and gods. And there's this back and forth 
this interplay all through this section. In Isaiah 41.9, God says this, I have called you back from the ends of the earth so that you can serve me. For I have chosen you and will not throw you away. Do not be afraid, for I am with you. Do not be dismayed, for I am your God. I will strengthen you. I will help you. I will uphold you with my victorious right hand. An amazing verse, amazing scripture, amazing word from God to these people. It's interesting, this whole section in 40 started with comfort, comfort my people, and there's this There's this word of comfort that, yes, you're in exile, but there's this word of encouragement to come back to Yahweh, come back to Jerusalem, the promised land. Do not be scattered anymore. And this kind of interplay in between trusting in God and not being afraid is two sides of the same coin. So God says, trust in me, and in that trust, it's do not be afraid. If you're trusting in God fully, there shouldn't be any fear. And the New Testament says perfect love casts out fear. So when you're trusting in God, do not be afraid. They come together. All right, and then we come to chapter 42, and it shifts a little bit, and we find our first servant poem in Isaiah 42, verse 1. It says this, Look at my servant, whom I strengthen." He is my chosen one whom I, who pleases me. Again, in this context, the first time servant is now being shifted to a person that he's speaking of. Look to my servant whom I am strengthened. He's my chosen one who pleases me. I've put my spirit upon him. He will bring justice to the nations. He will not shout or raise his voice in public. He will not crush the weakest reed or put out a flickering candle. He will bring justice to all who have been wronged. He will not falter or lose heart until justice prevails throughout the earth. Even distant lands beyond the sea will wait for his instruction. Man, the world is waiting for this. Verse 5, God, the Lord, created the heavens and stretched them out. He created the earth and everything in it. He gives breath to everyone, life to everyone who walks the earth. And it is he who says, I, the Lord, have called you to demonstrate my righteousness. I will take you by the hand and guard you. I will give you to my people Israel as a symbol of my covenant with them, and you will be a light to guide the nations. Verse 7, you will open up the eyes of the blind. You will free the captives from prison, releasing those who sit in dark dungeons. I am the Lord. That is my name. I will not give my glory to anyone else, nor share my praise with carved idols. Everything I prophesied has come true, and now I will prophesy again. I will tell you the future before it happens. 700 years, actually, before it happens. Powerful, powerful, the servant. God speaks of the servant coming that's going to bring justice, that's going to bring righteousness. He's going to prevail. He's going to be a gift to the nation of Israel. He's going to liberate and is going to set people free. And so here's some main points here. God is going to put the world right side up, and he's going to do it through his servant. The world's janked. The world's busted. The world's broken. But this servant that God is going to send is going to send it right side up. Second point, the servant is the focal point of the covenantal purposes of God. I don't know if that's how you spell covenantal. But anyway, uh, it looks weird to me in all caps. I don't know. But the servant is the focal point of the covenantal purposes of God. And then lastly, the servant embodies and lives out the covenant before God. He's a faithful one. He's going to be a perfect one. He's not going to, he's not going to fail when humans, where humans do. And yet at this time, Israel in exile, like I said, is God's very own possession and people. They have become blind themselves. It's a little trouble for the nation of Israel. The nation of Israel have become now blind because their hearts have given in to these lesser gods, these idols. Their allegiance are now tied to other than Yahweh. And people have become blind. And God in this section gives kind of a fatherly rebuke Isaiah 42, 18, oh, how deaf and blind you are towards me. Why won't you listen? 
Why do you refuse to see? Who in all the world is as blind as my own people, my servant? Who's as deaf as my messengers? Who is as blind as my chosen people? You see and understand what is right, but refuse to act on it. You hear, but you don't really listen. Man, that's straight talk from a good God who wants to see his people walking in the purposes that he made them for. Wake up. You're blind. Yahweh creates a strong case over that of worshiping idols. When you follow them, you become more enslaved to them. And he was, and he was, and he, God talks about the foolishness of this. In, in, in one little section, he says, one man cuts down a tree, and with half the tree, he makes his meal, and with the other half, he carves his idol upon which he worships it. Doesn't make sense. That's so foolish. It's a piece of wood. Or he talks about how in the culture of Babylon, how there were these massive idols named Bel and Nebo, and they would have these massive statues of them. And they worked so hard to keep them secure so they don't topple over. And God is saying, do you see the foolishness of that? It's foolishness worshiping other idols. Everyone serves a God. Everyone serves a God, whether you believe in him or not. We have functional gods all the time, whether it's Yahweh, or freedom, or pleasure, or money, or acceptance, or happiness. Back then, these things were attached to actual physical idols that you would worship. But it was the same thing that your heart was crying out for. The, the idol would be promising something that your heart would desperately want. You're like, kind of think, man, why would you worship a car, stone, stone or a carved idol? It doesn't make sense. It doesn't make sense to our 21st century. But that idol was promising something in the worship of it. Whether it be uh, good crops, fertility, whether it be... Uh, uh, maybe even curses upon your enemies. How you would worship these became their gods, these functional gods, and we have our same functional gods today. And we see in our culture, they prop up these gods, trying to, uh, trying to blast the message as, as, as deep as possible. Yes, you are broken, but look to the world to make you whole. And Yahweh is saying, man, that message has worked since back to Babel times, but my people, would you wake up? Don't be blind to the idols that you're surrounded by. He goes on, Isaiah 47, 8 says, you're a pleasure crazy kingdom, living at ease, feeling secure, bragging as if you're the greatest in the world. You say, I'm self-sufficient and not accountable to anyone. Man, if that has not been the spirit over our nation over the last hundred years, yet your idols lead you straight to destruction. Isaiah 44, 18 says, Those who follow them are blind and stupid. Their eyes are closed and cannot see. Their minds are shut and they cannot think. They cannot think rationally. They cannot think. It's mass hysteria. And yet, and yet, and yet, even though his people are in this disastrous condition, they're broken and they have no ability to get out of their mess on their own. Watch what God does. He's promising a coming, coming servant who will rescue and his people are scattered all over Babylon who seem to have succumbed to these, this, these lesser gods. Yet, even in the midst of all this corruption in his, of his people and how their hearts have become divided, God still seeks them out to bring them back to himself. Praise God. Amen. Isaiah 44, it says, I, the Lord, made you, and I will not forget to help you. I have swept away your sins like the morning mist. I have scattered your offenses like the clouds. Oh, return to me, for I have paid the price to set you free. God has done it all for them thus far. He's paved the way. He's clearing out all the obstacles that they may have to come back to Yahweh. He's calling an end to their exile, and he's calling them to return to the promised land. It's like a new exodus. 
So before he was calling them out of Egypt, he used Moses to call them out of Egypt and into the promised land. And here he's using Isaiah to call his people out of exile back to the promised land. It's a new exodus. God has formed you for his purpose and now you can walk in them. You can look at your condition, Israel, and say, yes, you are a mess. Yes, you are sinful and rebellious, but I have called you by name. You are mine. He's bringing his people back to Jerusalem to restore it. Do not be afraid. Trust in the God who made you and knows you. Isaiah 45. I am the Lord, he says. And there is no other. I publicly proclaim bold promises. I do not whisper obscurities in some dark corner so no one can understand what I mean. And I did not tell the people of Israel to ask me for something I did not plan to give. I, the Lord, speak only what is true and right. Man, he's a covenant-keeping, promise-making God. And we can see from this promise that he made to these exiles that are scattered all around Babylon, we can look back and say, holy cow, 400 years later, he, f- he fulfills that promise for all the world to see. Didn't do it in some obscure place, but before all the people. Isaiah 45, let all the world look to me for salvation, Yahweh says. For I am God, and there is no other. I have sworn by my own name, and I will never go back on my word. Every knee will bow to me, and every tongue will confess allegiance to my name. This is Yahweh speaking. The people will declare, the Lord is the source of my righteousness and strength. Man, every knee will bow to me, and every tongue will confess. In other words, this thing is going to go way beyond you, Israel, This is going to go actually to the ends of the earth. It's going to the nations. It's going to all peoples all over the world. In some ways, I think we find ourselves in a similar position of Israel, don't we? God calling us back to himself in the midst of a perverse and crooked generation. That oddly enough, we're seeing the same gods of Babylon reemerge in our own nation. The world, Babylon, American dream, that's not the place where you find home. It's only in him. He's the source of our rightness before him, and he is our strength. We are exiles in this fallen, evil world system, yet because of God's fulfilled promise coming to fruition in Jesus, we can come to him. So, come to him. Don't hold anything back. If you've never began this walk with the living God, the call is to repent, to put down your stubborn pride and rebellion and repent humbly before him. God, I'm a sinner and I need you for life. I need you to make me from a dead person to a live person. There's no way I can do it on my own. There's nothing good enough, no matter my volunteer hours or or no matter how nice of a person I am, that means nothing when it comes to heaven. He's a covenant-keeping, promise-making God, Father of all creation. And because of his servant's faithfulness in Jesus, he who comes to him with a repentant, believing heart, we are redeemed and set free of our own bondage, sin, and pride. God's cleared out the way. And it's only through this sent servant, Jesus, who came to establish a new covenant with us, one that's eternal and is extended to all who bow before him. And those of us who are his, maybe today the Holy Spirit revealed some big things that you need to let go of. These things that may have divided our heart along the way. There's many times that I was growing up and I would say, man, I, I'll never, I'll never. When I turn around, I find myself there. What are the things that are drawing your heart away from Yahweh? Yahweh says they will lead to further enslavement. It is foolishness. So his people, may we not be blind like his people were at this time. 
Trust in the good God that he is. And if there's anything, if there's anything that is kind of like yanked on your heart or divided your heart, repent of that. Repent of agreeing with that. And say, Jesus, come fill that place with your spirit. This place that I might look to when things kind of get a little dicey. God, I'm going to look to you instead of that. God, with all these, you know, relational things kind of going on, God, when it gets dicey, God, I'm going to turn to you. Repent that you've allowed that to stand in the way of this abundant relationship with Jesus. Hand it over to him. Allow him to fill you with his presence, his strength, his might, his faith, and his trust in him. Man, I'm so grateful to have a God like him that pursues us in our weakness and our brokenness. That he knows that there's nothing that we can do, but he still pursues and says, come back to me, my people. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, we thank you for your word. God, we thank you for, God, your promised servant. That, Father, hundreds of years before you sent him, God, you articulated exactly what he's going to come to do. Father, you, you, you communicated the spirit of the servant that's going to come and liberate. It's going to set us free. It's going to release us from bondage. Father, that, you are, that you're going to send this good gift of a servant, God, to lead us forward. And Father, I pray that this morning our hearts would be fully trusting in you. God, if there's anything that is pulling our hearts away, God, right now, we give it to you. We just hand it over into your hands to say, God, Lord, we repent of agreeing with this. And God, we give it to you. Send it into the abyss. Father, fill us with your presence. Where this resided, God, fill us with your presence. Fill us overflowing. In Jesus' name. And Father, if there's any of us that maybe have never begun this relationship with you, God, we too kind of come in that same posture. God, we repent of trying to be our own God for so long and doing a poor job at it. Father, I pray that we could come and just lay our whole life before you, our past, our present, and our future, to say in you we trust and believe in Jesus, the Son of God, who came to give a blood sacrifice, to establish a new covenant so we could be made right again in you. Without him and without that blood sacrifice, we're as helpless as the nation of Israel. But with you, Jesus, you bring us into your new established kingdom to walk with you. Thank you, Jesus. Jesus' name, amen.